Good morning, and thank you for joining uh, me, Sue Matt Stevens, Police and Crime Commissioner, and Andy, welcome, Andy Marsh, Chief Constable. So the reason that we have these, um, these sessions is so that you can send in questions that you want me to, to ask the Chief Constable. It's all to do with openness and, and accountability. So what we want to do, and we're all on the same side as this, we all want to make sure that our communities are as strong as possible and that we feel, that people feel safe. Uh, and so we are going to be talking about a whole range of subjects today, talking about road safety, protecting our most vulnerable and policing big events. So a very wide range of, of topics. So let's talk about road safety. As you know, this is something that residents frequently contact me about and in nearly in all our public forums people talk about it. And road safety means different things to different people um, depending on whether you are a cyclist, whether you are a, a, a driver, whether you are a pedestrian and of course for many of us we can be all of those. Um, there is a, a lack of a lack of tolerance um, between the, the different groups and and of course there are an, a number of individuals who've picked up some really bad habits I mean nothing drives me um, uh, more insane is when I see people using uh, mobile phones uh, and then we see people with uh, without wearing seat belts um, so we've there is always this potential for for conflict and uh, you know, I've had a, a very interesting um, messaging on, on social media from someone who's visually impaired about, you know, really badly parked cars. And I've had to push um, my mother-in-law in a wheelchair out into the middle of the road. So, you know, I think that makes a big impact on people. So we've, over the last seven years since I've been Police and Crime Commissioner, we've been able to see and work really hard on road safety and we've worked really hard with our partners, with our local authority partners and we've turned on some of the um, speed cameras in, in, specific, in specific areas. So I wonder if you could tell, tell uh, our viewers about what Avon Somerset can sadly continue to do to promote road safety. The, uh, it's, it is such a, an area of um, high interest because I think that uh, our communities um, about 1.7 million people, um, m most if not all of them use the road mm -hmm. and so it's one of the ways in which you're least like you're most likely sorry um, to encounter some sort of policing um, involvement or activity. Um, involvement in terms of enforcement um, if, if you are caught speeding um, but actually at a much more tragic end if if you or a member of your family is involved in a, in a collision uh, especially one that involves injury so it's incredibly irrelevant for us to be talking about it today. Maybe we'll cover some more of those issues later. W what are we doing about it? M much uh, too many things to go through it exhaustively, but to just deal with it in some cluster headings. Obviously enforcement. There is something called the desistance theory, that if ev even people who would describe themselves as law-abiding and good, if there's some fear that they will be caught on breaking a the law, they're much less likely um, to break the law, I uh, stay on the right right side of it. So, enforcement's important. The second is education, which is possibly even more important because we're, we're not interested in catching people breaking the law. We want people to be safe. Mm. We want to protect their property. We want them to allow them to go about their lives free from the fear of um, being harmed or indeed suffering some unnecessary enforcement activity. So, for education is possibly the biggest area, and then there's a whole um, area um, which we would call engineering. Um, situational management to try and prevent um, the risk of harm, traffic calming, safer junctions. Um, now all, all of those three areas are significantly um, conducted in partnership with local authorities, with fire and rescue um, authorities, with many other partners, Highways England, um, but also our biggest and most important partners, and hopefully some of them are listening today, are the members of public road users. So that, that broadly describes uh, the sort of work we're doing. And you, you know, because we've discussed it, that um, the speed enforcement, um, we, we actually catch more people than, than others. How are the fines used? Well, I, um, it would be very foolish of me to talk about um, tolerance levels for speeding, um, but I want to debunk the myth that people are caught one and two miles an hour over the speed limit. That, that's not the case. That, that, that we, we comply with the national um, guidance on this, uh, and indeed, uh, in some cases, we, we allow even more flexibility. So the people caught 
enforcement, breaking the limit, actually really are. Um, the uh, number's about 166,000 a year. The vast majority, about, about 140,000, go through an educational mm -hmm. um, process, which, which is a voluntary thing. Um, about 20,000 get fixed penalty notices and about three and a half thousand go straight to court because their, um, their speed was so outrageous that only a court can deal with it. Mm. Okay, I mean, I think, I think that's really relevant because you are given that second chance in Avon Somerset because in other forces, force areas, they don't have that speed awareness cause. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's very important to be clear on this that the only uh, revenue that is created from that activity, it goes to cost recovery or um, uh, initiatives, small amount to make our roads even safer. So this is not a cash generation operation for the police. We do more speed enforcement because we think this concept of desistance that I explained to you mm -hmm. um, makes our roads safer. And indeed, if we talk about the figures at some stage, whilst I can't evidentially prove um, it's because we're doing more enforcement, um, what I can say is that our um, casualty reduction, our collision reduction, particularly around the more serious end, um, it is uh, more significant than, than many other parts yeah, of the country. Yeah, it's bucking the national trend, isn't it? Yeah, ma is ma many, so since 2014, our collisions, including killed and serious injury ones, um, reduced by about 20%, uh, when, when mostly um, this is flat lining in other parts of the country. And obviously, uh, you know, any, any one is too many, but it's, it's, it, it is a significant drop. What can people do if they're concerned about speeding around their school or, or where their children are present? Well, I mean, you talked about the polarisation of views around um, different road users and different attitudes. I, I would say the polarisation also depends on who you are and what you're doing, where you are in your life, mm -hmm. where you live. So um, parents become more concerned around speeding in, in schools. Most people say they're concerned about speeding in their local communities. And yet when we do local speed enforcement in communities, it by and large is local people that are speeding and, and will um, make the excuse, well, I know the roads, it's mm -hmm. all right for me. So, so actually I would urge people to be socially responsible, but there, there's, uh, there's a couple of things that you can do. So unlike uh, many other police forces, I think that possibly there aren't any that, that, that also do this, we um, facilitate through our website the download of digital material um, to report um, poor, back, poor driver behaviour activity or other criminal matters. So you find it on our, our website. And in fact, um, many cyclists record near misses mm -hmm. and we use that data to make our roads safer around the areas where that keeps happening. So you know, uh, collisions involving pedestrians and cyclists tend to be the more serious. So you can download digital material on our website. And secondly, if you are concerned about speeding in your neighbourhood, please go onto our um, neighbourhood policing page um, and you can report a local concern there. Now, what, what might happen as a result? Well, we might do some work with partners. Um, we might do some uh, enforcement activity, including with the, um, the speed cameras as, as a result. W what we do encourage local communities to do is take some responsibility to work with us. And so there are 124... Uh, um, community speed watch. Community speed watch, thank you. Um, teams working in our force. And these are supported by our camera teams and our neighbourhood policing teams. And this is where people think, what's he talking about? This is where local people um, with some training, with some equipment in safe places, monitor um, speed. And I think last year we sent out about 35,000 um, warning letters to people breaking the, the, the speed limit. Uh, and indeed our neighbourhood teams back that up where there are repeat offenders by going around and, and giving more significant warnings. I'm a great fan of Community Speed Watch because it really means that the community is taking responsibility and helping and working with the police. It was invented in Avon Somerset, really? so we're very proud of it. What, what are you doing about solving the issues <coughs> about driving on mobile phones? Because we still see far too many people using their phones. Yeah, we call them the, the fatal four. <coughs> so speed, um, seat belts, mobile phone use, drink and drugs. Mm -hmm. And so we conduct um, enforcement activity around all, all four. Uh, w I would like us to do much more um, enforcement around mobile phones. Uh, the fact of the matter is it's limited to when we have patrol time and significantly the, the best way of enforcing it is an unmarked roads policing vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we do do enforcement and we do fall in line um, with uh, the national campaigns. I would advise anyone, uh, very, very foolish if they do it because you're putting yourself and other road users at risk. But if you're not worried about that, you're also putting yourself at risk of six points on your licence and a £200 fine 
and goodness knows how much more that will cost you on your insurance next time yeah. you renew it. So you're very, very foolish indeed um, if you do that. I mean, if like me, you've got teenage children, um, think about um, the advice, indeed instructions, if you can get away with that, you give them about putting their phone away, actually putting it away, mm. switching it off when they're in the car. Yeah, and so and think about the, the example you set yourself. And if you're in a car and someone is stupid enough when they're driving to use their phone, what are you going to do about it? I mean, if you sit there and say nothing, more fool you, I would say. Mm. So let's have a, a bit more social responsibility around this. Which is what we've, we've, we've got with society having decided that it's the right thing to wear seatbelts. It's, mm. it's communities and society that has made that difference. And, and you know, what, what, to, to what can we attribute the great fall in um, deaths on our roads? Because it has been very significant. You know, is it around safer roads? Is it around safer cars? Is it around safer um, driver behaviour, around drink, drugs, driving seatbelts? Is it about police enforcement, including automated enforcement? The truth is, it's about all all of mm. these all of these things. And and um, police are certainly working with tech companies to look at a methodology for um, more automated enforcement in a way that we can with speed mm -hmm. of mobile phone use in cars. Mm. That would be good. Now, it's always relevant, to sp particularly in our area, um, to talk about um, road closures mm. um, because on the motorway, we know if we close the motorway, it impacts severely on, you know, particularly around Bridgewater, that, you know, the high street grinds to a halt. We know that Bristol is completely snarled up when there are road closures. And quite often, the police are, are, are held responsible, but that's not quite true, is it? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's such a difficult area because um, we're all road users, including um, police officers on and off duty, so we, we, we want to minimise disruption. But, but where there, there is a risk to safety um, and the people dealing with the collision, we need to shut the road. Mm. And then where we need to facilitate um, the investigation, we'll do that by closing the road, but we'll do it as quickly as possible. We know the economic and um, personal frustration this, this causes, and we work with partners to, um, to do it uh, very quickly. And all I, I would say is, if you if you lost a loved one um, in a, in a, a fatal road traffic collision, you would expect us um, to do our very best to investigate it properly. Now we balance that against getting the road open as quickly as possible. Um, I have twenty four seven three six five, a very senior manager. We call him a gold commander that, that watches and observes and manages what's happening in the force. <clears throat> this is such a serious issue that if we have a major road closure, I, I've required that those people are told as quickly as possible about it so that they can assure themselves we're doing everything we can to get the road open as quickly as possible. Okay, well thank you for that assurance. And, and uh, you know, so uh, it's not long before you start getting um, phone calls and messages and, and you and I are in very close contact about um, major road closures because of the disruption it causes. Sure, sure, yeah. and. Uh, and we're just about to go into the summer with uh, no doubt more closures. So let's moving on, let's talk about protecting our most vulnerable from harm. As you know, I've prioritised um, supporting victims and vulnerable people. And I think we've made some really good progress in this, in this area because vulnerable people can be come into contact with the criminal justice system. We've seen that with cuckooing, we've seen that with a whole range of, of, of crime. And we need to make sure we're working with pol the police and with, with partners. So we've invested heavily in uh, services to support victims, including the, the Lighthouse Service. So how effective do you think that our current service is? So we, we, we always want more and better, of course. Um, but one of the, uh, the cornerstones of uh, your plan, the Police and Crime Plan, which, which is my job to deliver it, has been um, to improve the sort of services we offer to um, victims of crime, in particular the vulnerable ones, but generally victims of crime. And actually the creation of the Lighthouse has been a, a landmark in our, in our history of the last seven years. And what we would say through our survey, surveys of victims going through Lighthouses, the people that we support actually feel, and we've tested this, significantly more confident in the criminal justice system and they feel safer as a result of what the Lighthouse uh, police staff mm -hmm. do, do to support them. So we know that there's some success factors to it. We've recently brought the Lighthouse unit together with our safeguarding unit in, in, for one reason to create efficiency. Um, they deal with many of the same people. So v victims of crime uh, who are vulnerable quite often are also referred through safeguarding routes particularly children. So we, we feel that we can create efficiencies by bringing them together. We feel that we can also provide a better um, point of contact to partners 
uh, and indeed the, the vulnerable victims of crime themselves. That's quite a new um, step for us. It took, took place about eight months ago, and we are um, about to conduct a post-implementation review. We know that in the first months of this joint unit that we've seen a significant increase in referral units, mm -hmm. about 54% actually. We know that we've seen uh, a greater degree of compliance with risk assessment tools such as the domestic violence, we call it a dash risk assessment, and indeed officers now are given greater discretion to conduct, we call it a, 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 a blue, red, amber, green, brag risk assessment of any vulnerable um, person, which very often is a child in a domestic violence incident. Now, we, we've almost created a problem for ourselves in that we are identifying and referring more vulnerability now, and yet we've got um, the same or slightly fewer people doing the work. So part of the post-implementation review will be to um, better focus on where we can have most impact. Okay. So we, we, we feel that we're, um, we're making progress, we're, we're delivering significantly on your plan, uh, but actually we feel that we can continue to improve it. Great. Well, that's uh, something that we will continue to watch um, yeah. very closely. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in, in fairness to the people watching may be curious how the dynamic uh, of our working relationship um, plays out. Y you ask me quite often on a weekly basis um, about these referral rates uh, and uh, to gain an understanding of how effective it is and whether people are slipping through the net. So it's a topic of very regular conversation between us. Indeed. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on to protests. There, I, I, met, I met someone in Clevedon only last week who had been taken part in a, in a peaceful protest and he was concerned about the impact of, you know, of, of how the police manage um, peaceful protests. Um, so what is the attitude of the police to peaceful protests and marches which seem to we seem to have them almost every weekend now. Yeah, so we, we um, our role is um, to facilitate um, lawful and peaceful protest in a non-judgmental way, because quite often with protest there is a counter-protest element. Not always, mm -hmm. but but very often there is. And where you get that tension, it does require a great deal of additional policing. And and a case in point would have been some of the protests associated with the visit by the American President uh, Trump. So um, uh, we, we, to say that we've got an attitude um, towards, I, I would say, no, we haven't. Our role is to facilitate lawful and peaceful protest. And uh, we spend an awful lot of time doing it. In fact, most days, I would say, in Avon and Somerset, most often in Bristol, there is a protest of some form that yeah. we, we're involved in policing, and sometimes in an almost invisible way, and sometimes much more obvious. Okay. But we have seen some very peaceful protests almost get hijacked by troublemakers, haven't we? Yeah. Um, so what can you do, what advice can you give to groups if that happens? So the, the, the way in which we police protests continues to develop and we now uh, have a specific role of uh, specially trained officers, which is a protest liaison officer. I think we've got about, about 40 in the force. I, if you're having a protest, we would welcome you telling us and we will put you in touch with one of our liaison officers who will be able to advise you in the way in which um, you can stop your protest um, being hijacked by people that you wouldn't want associated with your, uh, the, uh, the area you're protesting about. So um, if you're protesting, um, let's say, about an environmental issue, mm -hmm. uh, and we saw this weekend at Glastonbury, mm -hmm. um, uh, Sir David Attenborough welcomed uh, on the stage at the Pyramid to talk about the environment, so this is an, an area of concern. You, you, don't, you don't want uh, the reputation or the cause or the issue damaged by people who um, might be violent, aggressive or offensive. And so we, we, we would say talk to us and we, we will help advise you in ways that you can make sure you, you achieve your aims in a lawful and peaceful way. I think that's a really important message. So you'd actually would like people to come and talk to you first. Definitely. So that they can, you can give them that, that advice. Absolutely, definitely. So, you know, we, we've seen where we we've, we've sometimes have requests from other forces. I'm thinking of the Trump uh, visit, mm. President Trump's visit, about how, um, the, you know, you were requested to send some of uh, our officers up there. So how does that work and what impact does it have on, on the ones who are left here? Mm. So the, the uh, um, policing in England and Wales is undertaken by 43 forces. And uh, uh, very often, even the biggest ones, such as the Metropolitan Police, can't cope with the operational demands put on them and will initiate a protocol between chief constables um, called mutual aid. 
and there is a coordinating centre in London called the National Police Operations Coordinating Centre, we love our acronyms, mm -hmm. NPOC, um, that brokers uh, this agreement. So with the Trump visit, uh, we had about 50 officers, the recent one, um, taking part in it. They were mainly specially trained officers around search and protest rather than big numbers of um, officers that deal with public disorder. So at 50 officers, they were all employed on rest day working. That means that the funds that you make available to me, to police Haven in Somerset, were not in any way impacted upon uh, because the, the, the money came from the Home Office to cover it. The, the consequence is, though, that those officers are not getting their rest days. Mm. Uh, they may be more tired, they've got less time with their family, they will be working away from home very long hours. Uh, and so actually my concern is for their health and well-being and the impact on uh, the, 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 the mainstream policing services in Haven and Somerset. And my concern is always when any of the politicians announce that there's going to be extra officers on the street. Mm. There's no such thing, is there? The, all we're meaning is that we, that those officers that we've got are working rest days time and, and getting to the point, because we don't have a little room that we have, mm. we keep all these extra police just in case they, they suddenly get announced. So it does put a lot of pressure on our existing police officers, doesn't and, it? And you know, we've seen that with a very busy weekend running through Glastonbury. We, we have had a reduction since 2010 of about uh, 700 uh, police officers, and so that that and now it takes, and this is a, uh, an issue that is is rarely de debated or recognised in in the media or through public debate. It takes over three years to uh, recruit and train a police officer. Mm -hmm. So the concept of additional police officers can only be delivered one way, and that's through working our existing cohort even harder. Mm. And that the pressure on them uh, is is beginning to be recognised. We heard yesterday that eight, eight in ten front line officers are, have been assaulted in the last year. And I know that Avon and Somerset can stand do a lot on, on, on supporting uh, those officers as I say in my early morning report so it's far too many and it is mm. increasing. But let's talk on a, on a, on a more uh, joyful subject. We went to, last weekend was Glastonbury mm. um, which was uh, a very hot event, mm -hmm. um, but a, hu a huge policing effort. So can you tell viewers a little bit more about the policing approach of doing such a, a massive, massive event such it, as that? It, uh, depending on how you present uh, the, the figures around its size and scale, it's widely recognised as the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. And it happens in the Mendips. And uh, over a period of weekend, uh, the, the population of the whole of Somerset increases by a third. So over 200,000 um, festival goers and obviously you can imagine the supporting train of workers um, mm -hmm. the, the, the behind that. We've been policing it for many years and I've seen it change over the years. I've been policing it since the 80s uh, when crime levels were much much higher. So we, we plan for it all, all year round. We work very closely with the festival orga organisers who've got certain legal responsibilities to fulfil to keep people um, safe and our, our objective at that festival is, is that people are safe and we, we, su we support them having a, a good weekend. Mm. Um, what are the types of issues that the police deal with? The, uh, the first one that we get is traffic congestion, uh, which is largely undertaken by a, a private plan around traffic management, which we support and advise upon. W once people get on site, there are issues of um, public safety, mm -hmm. and or, we, 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 I don't want to preempt any coroner's inquest, but when you have that many people gathered in one place, you get all of the, the sort of issues that would happen in a medium-sized town, yes. you know, maybe the size of Swindon, um, will happen in the middle of the Mendip. So, you know, very sadly this year we had two, two sudden deaths. Mm. Um, so we have to deal with that. And then we have the full range of offences and incidents uh, and a general crisis that people would experience where they'll ask the police to help. Um, we had about 110 uh, crimes reported to us this year, which is significantly down on 2017 and immeasurably down on the time on when I would was. have placed it in the 80s and 90s. Well, in fact, we talked when we were there, didn't we, to, to some of the uh, festival goers who had been com coming for 10 or 15 years, and they said it was a much, much safer environment yeah. than it has ever been. The, the, um, the, certainly, the, uh, we're very proud of uh, the role that we've developed placing such a complex event, uh, indeed recognised globally, internationally, mm. um, by police forces that, that have to police similar events and want to talk to us about 
how do we deal with crowd safety, um, how do we deal with harm reduction, how do we deal with crime prevention. And uh, we're, we're very proud of the safety record which we've supported the organisers in, in creating. I'm often asked, what's the police approach to drugs at Glastonbury? Yeah, and, and uh, actually we don't send police officers out on the streets of Avon and Somerset 24 7 365 to catch people in possession of small amounts of drug. We, we have got much more important pressing needs of public safety to deal mm. with. Mm. Um, but that said, we certainly won't ignore it if it's pushed under our nose. And what, what we do is lots of work in advance to advise people about the dangers of taking drugs. We also advise people about the, the risk to them of being caught if they come to Glastonbury with drugs with intention to deal it. And so there are um, deposit pins on the doors, um, there is a search regime, which if you're going to bring drugs to Glastonbury to deal, you, you are in some jeopardy of getting caught mm. and you, mm. will, you will be prosecuted. So in terms of arrests, that was the most significant amount of activity that we undertook was arresting people for what we would say is possession with intent to supply offences. So our, our primary motivation is, is to catch people supplying yeah. um, because we want to prevent harm. Uh, particularly to young people and vulnerable people. So uh, what I would say in answer to that question is that it, it, you know, it, it is nuanced um, because policing is complicated um, and you'll deal with the most pressing priority. Um, but, but actually our priority, our approach to drugs is very similar at the festival to generally. And this yeah. weekend coming, we will be um, policing the St Paul's Carnival and it will be exactly the same there as it was at Glastonbury Festival. So, you know, don't let anyone suggest differently. It's not any different. Okay, thank, well, thank you. For, is you is, that is something that's often, often raised. So we're going to run out, of, we've run out of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to add, Andy? The, uh, it's a busy time of year. Yeah. Uh, the, um, so everyone likes to have some time off. Um, it's pretty important, actually, have some time off with your, mm -hmm. your, your family and to relax and get away from work, which makes it an even busier time for policing. And so um, we're, we're at what we would say is our highest demand period. Um, so I, I would say it's a, uh, if you want to report, we talked about speeding earlier, but we have significant use of our website for digital reporting of crime. And I was chatting uh, also at the festival to a member of the public who in an entirely unsolicited way said, I bet you don't have many people tell you your website's brilliant. And I said, well, go on, tell me more. And they reported the theft of a, a pedal cycle, which he was very cross actually, his son had left it somewhere he shouldn't have, and he, he found it um, incredibly convenient and intuitive to report the, the theft. So one, one way that people can help us is to um, help work with us on our digital means of reporting crimes where they feel it's appropriate. Mm. And if they don't feel it's appropriate, they can ring us up and uh, we'll certainly attend uh, where it is appropriate to attend. Thank you for that and uh, would certainly like to pass on our thanks to officers, especially in the, this last, uh, when it's been so hot, mm, uh, it's been a, a, a tough on the streets. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to, to listen to this. I hope it was interesting. Uh, if you have a, uh, questions, I think our next session will be on, in September the 3rd. So if you've got questions that you'd like me to put to the Chief Constable, um, then I'm very happy to do so. Always remember that it's your police service and what we are trying to do is, is improve that accessibility and accountability to you. So until next time, thank you.